Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it is my first time at um, CLAWS, and I'm very grateful for the invitation, and even more so because it is my first time in India, and it's great to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to be speaking in front of an audience that includes uh, military officers, academics, practitioners. Um, as a journalist, someone who's worked in journalism for the past 20 years who has crossed over into uh, some writing on history and on the science and technology of national security, I like to think what I have to offer is the translation of 20 years of interviews with scientists and technologists who work with the military um, to try to draw out some lessons of how science and technology contributes to warfare, both historically, current, and in the future. And so when we talk about cyber warfare, I actually want to start with a little bit of a history lesson of where this goes back to, um, which is the early 1960s, um, at the beginning of the, uh, very early in the Cold War after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Sorry. How do I go to the next page? Yeah, how do I click to the next slide? Technical di difficulties in the age of information warfare. And can you use this app? And this, okay, great, thank you. Um, so before we talk about offensive cyber war, and I think there's, it's very sexy to attach cyber to anything these days, but really what we're talking about is computer networking. And if we want to talk about cyber warfare in the current tense, let's go back to where this all comes from, which is the early 1960s um, at the Pentagon in an agency called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, now called DARPA. Um, it was the early days of the Cold War, and the Pentagon was just beginning to use computers um, for the first time interacting with people. One of the first indentations of this um, was SAGE, a Cold War computer system that was designed to link 23 air defense sites to coordinate tracking of Soviet bombers in case of an attack on the United States. Um, one of the scientists who worked on this, J.C.R. Licklider, today known as the godfather of the Internet, um, was brought into the Pentagon, into this new agency, to take over a program known as Command and Control, looking at computers. Very, very early days of computers. And um, when I interviewed Pentagon officials who were there at the time about what they thought was going to be worked on, they said, oh, something with computers and nuclear command and control. Um, but Licklider had a much broader, almost messianic view of the future. Um, computers at the time were mostly mainframe beasts that sat in a laboratory. You went in with punch cards and you crunched numbers. And Licklider, who had worked on the SAGE system where human operators um, interacted with the computer, had a very different vision. Um, one that may seem obvious now, but was really revolutionary for the time. He said computers are going to transform human decision making. Rather than just be a tool that we use, the way people interact with computers and the way those computers get into the decision cycle uh, will be transformative. You know, he said artificial intelligence might come down the line later on, but there's going to be an interim stage that could last you know, decades, if not longer, of human, of human machine symbiosis, of these two things working together. You know, uh, uh, and the funny thing is, at the time, a lot of Pentagon officials had no idea what he was talking about. But they kind of let him go on this research. They said, you know, he was a very smart guy. He seemed to be doing interesting things. And you know what? It's just a few million dollars. Um, well, very quickly, things began to change in the early 1960s. The U.S. had an increasing involvement um, in Vietnam. And already there was this nation computer work going on at the Pentagon. Um, so what we see here in 1969 was the first four nodes of what became ARPANET, and late, which was the predecessor to the internet. And it was basically in just five years sketched out from an idea to the first four nodes on the network very, very quickly. There was um, a myth that developed that ARPANET was supposed to be an Armageddon command and control system. It was nothing of the sort. There were future nuclear applications envisioned for it, but it was really at that point just an, it was linking academic sites, trying to see can you link um, computers together, can you network them. 
And this phrase of the intergalactic network was sort of a joke that Licklider used in one of his early memos um, about computer networking, saying that this is, he's speaking to a community of people who are going to learn to network these computers together. So what happened very quickly? What changed? Well, first what changed was the Cold War soon transitioned over into a lot of focus on the Vietnam War, where the United States was getting increasingly involved in Southeast Asia and against counterinsurgents, against the communist Viet Cong. And very quickly, one of the questions is, okay, how do you adapt this nation's science of computer networking to insurgency, something that we were thinking about for nuclear command and control? And one of the earliest proposals was from a group of scientific advisors advisors that said, okay, we have a problem along the Ho Chi Minh Trail where we have a lot of smuggling of weapons from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. Um, how do we stop this? And so a group of scientific advisors who were, com who were familiar with this early work in computing said, okay, we have an idea. We could drop a um, series of sensors along the airborne trail and link them back to an IBM mainframe computer in Thailand, which will then start to derive targets that can be transmitted to, to, um, to helicopter gunships. And it was sort of, a, again, it seems something very obvious at the time that we have this. Um, but at the time, this was something truly revolutionary of linking sensors directly to a computer that derives targets and transmits it to aircraft to take out targets. Um, it was really the first example. In later years, it's been called network center warfare. But I would say this all goes back to the idea of computer networks and how they're used in warfare. Um, it was a technical success. Um, I think, as many of you know, it but later decisively got called the McNamara line. It was probably a strategic failure. Um, but what eventually happened was the transition of this technology to something else, and that I think is a situation very familiar with where we are right now. The U.S. was involved for over 10 years with counterinsurgency in Vietnam, and when it came out of Vietnam, what it found was it had been spending 10 years of investment in fighting insurgents, while other countries, particularly the Soviet Union, had invested in modernization, particularly in conventional forces in Europe. Um, the US, U.S. and its European allies were outnumbered. They felt that the Soviet's technology had uh, developed faster than the United States had, which had been spending on Vietnam. So there was a long-term research and development plan at the Pentagon of how do we take the technologies that we've developed in Vietnam to include computer networking, to include precision warfare, and try to use them on the European battlefield. And one of the concepts that, that came up with was this idea of a, of a salt breaker, which again, similar to some of the technology that came out of the McNamara line in Vietnam, was to link submunitions that would be queued um, by a command and control computer system to get this to network together, that you would be operating along a computer network. Um, so that didn't actually, um, You can tell I'm a journalist. I don't use PowerPoint a lot. Uh, so the idea of a salt breaker, which was going to be a number of different systems, never got developed. But what came out of it was Joint Stars, um, the Joint Surveillance Target Attack radar system, which many of you may know from the first Gulf War, which was still a prototype when it debuted. And was, again, the first time that they could, you could send information from the Jade Stars aircraft down to a computer processing system and transmit it to targets. And it was considered a key, um, a key targeting system, what became known as the Highway of Death in 1991, when U.S. forces attacked retreating Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. And J Stars, which came out of this early networking system, was really one of the stars out of that war. So that was, again, a technical success, um, so much so that in the late 1990s, when the Army approached DARPA um, about some of their problems, again, computer networking came into play. It was 1999 at the end of the Kosovo Air War, and the Army had gotten so bogged down that it risked being irrelevant. It had tried to deploy Apaches to Kosovo, um, only to find that they were there weeks too late. So the Army Chief of Staff at the time, Eric Shinseki, approached DARPA, this Pentagon Research Agency, and said, can you come up with a way that we can deploy faster and lighter? 
And the proposal that they came up with was, okay, suppose we distribute combat capabilities on a network. Rather than having everything in one or two vehicles, we can use the network to try to link different vehicles together. It was an interesting idea, except just a couple problems. The ad hoc networks that you needed to make it work were not technologically available. As one former Pentagon official described it to me at the time, it was basically that you substitute electrons for armor. And the idea was if you had enough information, that would make up for your lack of armor. Uh, well, this was a fine idea starting in 1999 and went on uh, through 2002, 2003. And then there was the invasion of Iraq. And suddenly the lesson you learned was you could never have enough information to make up for armor. So, what was interesting about what happened, similar to the Vietnam period, was you again had another transition in 2001 and then to 2003 with the invasion of Iraq. You went from, uh, you went from thinking about conventional warfare to battling insurgencies. Uh, one of the most innovative projects that came out of this time was the National Security Agency's, forgive the type of the real-time regional gateway, which was about getting into foreign networks. It was taking the data feeds that the NSA had with all of the available information and data mining it very quickly to try to break up the insurgency in Iraq. It was, I think, Bob Woodward, the journalist, who was one of the first to talk about it because highly classified at the time, called it the equivalent of the Manhattan Project. Um, this slide, which is actually was uh, one of the slides released when Ed Edward Snowden released documents to journalists, this has now been largely declassified. You can go to the, to the National Cryptological Museum near the NSA, and they actually have a whole display on the real-time regional gateway. So that regional, real-time regional gateway was a success, or regarded success in Iraq and breaking up insurgent networks. They then tried to bring it to Afghanistan, uh, but enhancing it with things like social media feeds. So this is a picture of an experiment the Pentagon did trying to see, they released 10 red balloons across the United States, trying to see if you could leverage intelligence from social media, from social networks, to try to spot the different red balloons, and then apply the science of social networking in Afghanistan. Can you pull in information from social data feed, from social media, um, from cell phones that you distribute to Afghans, uh, from the price of commodities and markets, and integrate that with feeds that the NSA is getting and get sort of predictions on where attacks will be IED attacks. Um, so by the time we get to 2016, we're no longer fighting sort of insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. We now have an entirely different problem, which is the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Um, I think computer networking up to that point had been largely about trying to get an advantage over enemies, get into their networks, collect information. Um, this was one of the first instances um, of, uh, of an actual operation called Operation Glowing Symphony, which was where U.S. Cyber Command actually tried to hack into the Islamic caliphates, their digital networks. It was a mix of malware, of trying to take over Twitter accounts, and really trying to break up uh, what they were doing. And if you think about it, it's one of the, um, that the biggest cyber operation from Cyber Command to date wasn't so much about installing malware to break up a military operation, but trying to attack their information networks. It's a very different theory of cyber operations than I think people thought about um, years ago. Um, so I think where we're at today is, I think, a real lack of thing. You know, we think of today as sort of offensive cyber warfare as malware or something like Stuxnet. But if the biggest operations we've seen today, to date are trying to attack the Islamic State's propaganda operations, and if the biggest attacks against us have been things like Russian interference and meddling in our, in our elections, I think we need to have a different viewpoint of how we use the computer network and what we're defending against. Um, this is one of the first attacks that I think that the Pentagon actually publicly acknowledged, uh, which was a cyber retaliation against Iran uh, last year, which was very sort of a, a considered a moderate escalation. But I think where we are, um, 
is very much where we were at the end of the Vietnam period. In Vietnam, we had spent 10 years investing in technologies for counterinsurgency. We have spent the last 20 years looking at our network operations for operating in Iraq and Afghanistan, while China has been investing in their cyber capabilities, while Russia has been experimenting with different ways of, of operating in the cyber realm. We, what we lack today, I think, are the visionaries that we had in the 1960s thinking about what is computer networking, how do we use it, what goals are we trying to achieve. And I think some of that will come out as a response to the National Defense Strategy of 2018 where we were moving away from insurgencies and looking at great power competition. But I don't think we're seeing um, a really good comprehensive look at what, is our, what are the technologies that we need for cyber warfare, what are we trying to achieve. Thank you.